Sadanandana Brajajanarandana Jamanatira Vanajani Jamanatira Vanajani Jaya Radha Madhava Kanjabihadi Madhava Kanjabihadi Jaya Radha Madhava Kanjabihadi Pad Parabha Hangsa Parivija Kacharaja Asta Tarasata Si Sri Madhya's Divine Grace Si Si Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shira Prabhupada Ki Ananta Koti Vaishnavarinda Ki Si Sri Radha Gopi Bhallava Ki Gaur Pimanandi Do you happen to know the verse from Bhagavad Gita for this evening? Some. Okay, we'll do 922. Nobody will know the difference. Could you get me Bhagavad Gita? Okay, thank you. I think we'll mention something at the very beginning. This is the appearance day of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, whose painting is by the side of Srila Prabhupada's Vyasa son. I spoke at length this morning about the life and the contribution of Bhaktivinoda Thakur for those of you that aren't so familiar with him. I'll mention something in his honor. Bhaktivinoda Thakur was a, a very unique, uh, empowered representative of Lord Chaitanya. On our altar, every altar in ISKCON and most of the altars on people's, in people's homes, on the bottom row you see our disciplic succession. There's Srila Prabhupada, Bhakti Siddhanta, Gorkishor, with the garland, that's Bhakti Minot Thakur, Jagannath Das Babaji, and to the right is the six Goswamis. They're associates of Lord Chaitanya. Over 500 years ago, they lived in Vrindavan and carried out Lord Chaitanya's instructions to do two primary things, write books according to the teachings he had given, and to establish the places of Krishna's pastimes, which since the time of Krishna's presence so many years ago, thousands of years ago, the places had been lost. So those are their two assignments. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur is called the sixth Goswami, although he was a householder, had 10 children. You have two children, keep you busy. Some of you have two children. Keep you busy. Ten children. So, but yet he was called Goswami because often the title Goswami is assigned to someone who's in the renounced order of life. Swami or Goswami means one who has control of their senses. Go means senses and Swami means master. Master of the senses. So he was a master of his senses in that um, he absorbed himself in the activities of bhakti while carrying out his duties as a householder, raising his family, living 
during the height of British occupancy, living as a high court judge appointed by the British, which never happened because they wanted highly appointed positions to be British people to rule India. But he was selected, appointed, because of his outstanding qualification. Here's a little Bhakti Vindu Thakur story. His, his life didn't, he, he was born in an aristocratic family, very wealthy aristocratic family, but when he was very young, his father died. So he was raised largely by his grandfather. And many things happened, but when he completed his college education, because he was an aristocratic young man, he was given service as a manager in a, in a business. And one of the first things that he did as the manager of the business is he saw there was an error in favor of the company where a person who was a customer was overcharged. So he went to the customer and gave him back the money that he was overcharged by. The person that was the owner of the business that he was managing said, I think you have the wrong occupation. You can't do that in this business. You, ha you should be a teacher or something where, you know, mode of goodness and honesty is very important, not, not, not in a business like this. So he became a teacher and then he became a court judge, even without becoming a lawyer. He just became a judge because of his excellent qualification. Another little story. In addition to step by step, as happens in civil service in India, he was changed from place to place and given some promotion and you know slightly larger salary. Those of you from India know what you do when you're in a civil servant. You take bribes, you just put it bluntly. So, but he, he didn't do that. He was an ethical person. He just wouldn't do that. So one of, the, one of the services he was given as a judge was in a, a city where just outside on the outskirts of the city, there was um, a, a ghostly haunted tree. And people of that place were afraid of the ghost. So they would go to the tree and make offerings to the ghost in the tree. It was kind of spooky and they were fearful. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur didn't have to do that because he's a judge, but what he did was he found a, a brahmana who was needing some assistance, some donation, some contribution. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur said, I'll maintain you with, with some funds. Just all you have to do is sit underneath the tree every day and recite Srimad Bhagavatam aloud. And there's how many verses in Srimad Bhagavatam? 18,000 verses. So he recited the entire Srimad Bhagavatam. And when he finished the last verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, a branch way up in the upper part of the tree broke and a voice came from the sky saying the ghost was released from that being inhabited by the tree or within the tree saying basically thank you, you've relieved me of this curse of becoming a ghost just by the recitation of Srimad Bhagavatam. That's the kind of faith and the kind of activity we discussed some other ones. Fearless, fearless in the face of addressing whatever the circumstance of life was with the truth and with spiritual consciousness. There's another Bhakti Vinod Thakur story. After some time when he was living in Puri as the high court judge in Puri, he was also given the responsibility of overseeing the affairs of the temple. Not doing the seva, but managing, overseeing. You know. So he found out in the course of overseeing the affairs of the temple that the king 
of Puri was stealing. And he received or gathered hard evidence and then he pronounced a sentence to the king for stealing from the deity. He said, you have to um, feed, uh, it, it, you provide the offerings for Lord Jagannath. This is something that he did at the very beginning, is according to the, the, the scripture that they follow for the worship of the deity, there's supposed to be 56 offerings a day. Literally, as soon as one offering is taken, another offering is placed. The standard had been reduced. He brought the standard back up to 56 offerings a day. He told the king, you should pay the full amount for the offerings, 56 offerings a day for some period of time, some months. That's, that's your, that was his penalty. You know, give to the deity. What a penalty. Because you're stealing from the deity, so give to the deity. Um, the king became angry. So the king engaged some brahmanas that knew tantra. The purpose of the tantra was to have Bhakti Manod killed. And it was a 30-day ritual. At the end of the 30 days, the king's son died. And he realized what a great personality he was dealing with and came and confessed. He said, Bhakti Manod Thakur said, I knew what you were doing, but I knew the Lord was, the Lord's protection would be there. So please, you know, don't, don't mess with Lord Jagannath, basically. And, and those that are devoted to him. The king learned a hard lesson. He lost his son. Many such circumstances. As he was living in Puri, those of you that may have visited in Puri, there's a very beautiful area on the side of Grand Road called the Jagannath Balab Gardens. Have you been there? Jagannath Balab Gardens. So Bhakti Manu Thakur would regularly go inside. That's a place where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, halfway through the Ratha Yatra, after dancing and dancing and dancing, he would go and take rest while the cart was standing still and they were offering um, offerings. Any of the public could come and bring offerings and place on the cart of Jagannath and they would be offered to Lord Jagannath. This is like a, an essential part of Ratha Yatra festival. So when that was going on, he went to rest in Jagannath Balab Gardens. So in honor of Lord Jagannath, Bhakti Vinod Thakur would hold di discourses on Srimad Bhagavatam in those Jagannath Balab Gardens. But there was one very well-respected Babaji who took exception to the fact that Bhakti Vinod Thakur is speaking Srimad Bhagavatam, but he's not wearing Kunti Mala, neck beads. And he's not wearing tilak. How can he speak Srimad Bhagavatam? He's an imposter. So he went around <laughs> saying bad things. And that man contracted some disease with a high fever. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur came to find out that he had a fever. Didn't say, you know, why the fever, but he had a fever. He knew that the man was speaking bad things, but he, he, he went to visit him and prescribed some medicine and made sure that daily the medicine was administered to this Babaji and he revived. And then the Babaji came and said, uh, I was saying bad things about you. I think I got this reaction for, for doing that. But could you tell me why it is that you speak Srimad Bhagavatam without wearing neck beads and without wearing tilak. He said, because I haven't been initiated yet. I haven't found my Diksha Guru, although I've heard these teachings from others and I'm speaking the teachings that I've heard, I have yet to take initiation. At least it was a practice that he followed. So I don't yet wear tilak and wear kuntimala. Now we do before initiation, but that was a standard that he was following and the Babaji profusely apologized. When protected, this is one of the symptoms, that, according to Padma Purana, there's six limbs or angas of surrender. 
And one of them is to feel the Lord as one's protector. Rakshititi Vishvaso. Raksha means protection. So one who is surrendered feels Krishna is my protector. So he was feeling and in fact was protected, like Prahlad was protected by Lord Vishnu. He didn't have to go and fold his palms and say, please protect me from this Hiranyakashipu. He just was protected. Same Bhakti Vinod Thakur was, was like that. His life was fully dedicated. His life was fully dedicated to um, receiving and giving the Holy Name and Lord Chaitanya's message. Very, very, very powerful Acharya. We listed this morning his accomplishments, many, 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 many. And take any one of them and it's multiple lifetimes worth of work. He wrote 100 books. Ever write a book? 100 books. Raised 10 children, one of them a pure devotee, Acharya in the line of disciplic succession, discovering the place of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's birth. Okay. So we're honoring the appearance day of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Frankly speaking, that, that our being here, or that the, the now something like 650 centers around the world with deities, what to speak of all the centers that don't yet have deities or preaching centers or storefronts or lofts or different, different, different situations, what to speak of all the home programs and gatherings. That's by the grace of our founder Acharya, but the force and the vision to do that came from his spiritual master, received it from Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So we're here because of him. We're indebted and offering our respects to him on his appearance day. So now, Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, text 22. Text 22. Oh, nice verse. Ananyas chintayanto mam Yejana paryupasate Tesham nityabhiyuktanam Yoga kshema vaham yaham That was very good. Let's do it again. Ananyas chintayanto mam Yejana paryupasate Tesham nityabhiyuktanam Yoga kshemam vaham yaham Translation, but those who always worship me with exclusive devotion, meditating in my transcendental form to them. I carry what they lack and I preserve what they have. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole of Bhagavad Gita. It's very personal. Krishna is very personal. Some people don't like the idea that the absolute truth is a person. I happen to like the idea very much. And there's reciprocation. And with, with the relationship with the person, it's something that we do and something that the person does. It's, that's, and it's, and there's not a scorekeeper. It's we wish to be with someone and that someone wishes to be with us. We wish to serve the happiness, seek the happiness of the beloved and the beloved wishes to seek the happiness of their lover. It's very nice. Very natural. Who would want it some other way? Some people want it some other way, out of frustration. But this is 
um, such a nice personal explanation. The previous verse is the contrast, those that seek sense gratification. So, you know, the self is the center, and when the self is the center, that means the, per the person, the supreme person, is blocked or obscured. We don't recognize it's all about me. And then that me means this body, and the, the body is the senses, and the senses seek sense gratification. Wasted life and sense gratification, but in contrast is this. Purport, short purport. One who is unable to live for a moment without Krishna consciousness cannot but think of Krishna 24 hours a day. Being engaged in devotional service by hearing, chanting, remembering, offering prayers, worshiping, serving the lotus feet of the Lord. Notice there's nine processes of bhakti that are being identified. And they start with hearing and chanting. And then remembering etc. Rendering other services, cultivating friendship, and surrendering fully to the Lord. Such activities are all auspicious and full of spiritual potencies, which makes the devotee perfect in self-realization, so that his only desire is to achieve the association of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, such a devotee undoubtedly approaches the Lord without difficulty. This is called yoga. And by the mercy of the Lord, such devotee never comes back to this material condition of life. Kshema, it's the K-S with a dot under it, Kshema, K-S-E-M-A, means the merciful protection of the Lord. It refers to the merciful protection of the Lord. The Lord helps the devotee to achieve Krishna consciousness by yoga. And when he becomes fully Krishna conscious, the Lord protects him from falling down to a miserable conditioned life. This is again this um, we discussed about Bhaktivinoda Thakur and feeling always Krishna's protection. I mentioned the word raksha, the Sanskrit word that means protection, and kshema similarly means protection. I don't know the slight difference between the two words, but they have the same connotation. When one takes shelter of a powerful person, that powerful person naturally extends protection to the one who's taking shelter of them. It's very natural, especially when that person who's being taken shelter of is very merciful and very kind and very affectionate and very compassionate. It's just completely natural. Prabhupada gives this example, uh, a child walking down the street holding the hand of their father and they're feeling very safe. In all circumstances of life, their father has always given them protection. So they're feeling that, no worry. And as they're going along the street, here comes a big dog, woof, woof, woof. And the child, just holding on to their father, no worry, because my father has always protected me. One time in India, this is anecdotal, one time in India I was um, going for a Japa walk early in the morning at a university campus, it was IIT Delhi, before the morning class. It was after Mangalarti and before the morning class. And it's, it's real quiet on the campus early morning. Later it gets busy and very peaceful. But those of you from India, you know there's a phenomena called stray dogs or homeless dogs. <laughs> and they hang out in groups. So as I was walking by chanting Java, softly, 
One of the dogs would lift his head, hear me coming by, and go, woof, woof. The other dogs would hear the woof, woof, and they'd lift their heads and go, woof, woof. Stay away from our territory. This is our territory. Right? So I just kept walking, and they put their heads down and went back to sleep. So one morning, it was like you know, they had different places that was like their territory. They would move from, kind of stake out their places. So one morning, I was walking, and there was a professor who had a little white poodle, French poodle, on a leash on one hand, and he had a stick in the other hand. So I was watching, and the dogs heard the professor coming by, and they saw the little poodle, looked like a meal for them, and they didn't just lift their head, they stood up, and the big guy, you know, the leader of the pack, did his woof woof, and then the other dogs, you know, got up and they did their echo, woof woof. And the professor took the poodle under his arm and held the stick with his other hand and shook the stick, kept walking. And the, the lead dog looked at the stick, looked at the other dogs, looked at the stick, <laughs> looked at the other dogs, went back and laid down. And the poodle is licking the cheek of the, of the professor and wagging his little tail because he was feeling protected. There are these dogs like five times his size. He's just a little guy. But he was protected. And the verse that morning happened to be on the very same topic. So I remember it very well. Sa, nata, and a, nata. Sa is with. Nata means master or lord. So one who has sa, nata, one who is kshema or one who is Raksha, protected, taking shelter of one who gives protection, they have nothing to fear. Like the little poodle, just wagging his tail. Very, very peaceful. And the others were anatta. So they had to gang up and, you know, show their teeth and growl and put the hair on the back of their neck, stand up, and I'm tough. Don't come near my territory. But it's actually, they're in the fearful position. Now, now this verse is speaking about one who isn't interested in contrast to the previous verse, not interested in a life of sense gratification and trying to improve the standard of sense gratification to the next standard up to heavenly standard and even beyond heavenly standard of sense gratification. One who ha doesn't have that interest but has their interest as one thing, this refers back to Bhuti Yoga described in Canto 2 of Bhagavad Gita. Bhuti Yoga is intelligence is fixed, very singular focus. What's that focus? Described here, attaining the association of Krishna. So whatever I see, whatever I do, whatever I think, whatever I feel, whatever I speak, it has one purpose. Attaining the association of Krishna. And then, so that's what the devotee the who's fixed in Buddha Yoga does. And what does Krishna do? This is the confidential part. Tesham means, that's how the verse begins, unto those who, satata yukta tanam, bhajatam, bhaja, they engage in devotional service, bhajatam priti, means with love. Prema and priti are very similar. Jiva Goswami, he likes priti, the word. So he named a whole Sandarbha after, Priti Sandarbha. It's prema, the stage of love. Uh, unto those persons who, who engage themselves in that way, meditating on my form, fixed on that, and, in, and it, with love, offering whatever they have in service to, to Krishna. What does Krishna do? Whatever it is that they have, Krishna preserves, Whatever it is that they need, 
Krishna provides. They don't have to go, you know, into the protection program, gathering stuff, so just in case, just in case. Because, you know, anything could happen, so just in case. They don't need to do like that. Prabhupada told the story when he was a young householder in India, uh, in Allahabad. He had a, um, a store, a pharmacy, a pharmaceutical s- operation of some kind. And there was also a, a temple, one of Bhakti Siddhanta's temples. And elaborate description, Prabhupada explained how the British had arranged an artificial famine. They bought up all the rice and they withheld it to create like a panic situation. Prabhupada said people were dying. The price of rice for a simple person was normally, he gave some rupee figure, but now it was 10 times that and people couldn't afford 10 times that, so they died of starvation. So Prabhupada was very concerned about the temple, maybe they're in difficulty. So he went to the temple and said, do, do you need anything? He said, oh, Krishna's taking care. We have, we have so much, we're distributing to people that don't have. But thank you very much. So then he said, I could understand. Krishna's yoga kshem of ahamyam. Whatever it is that they need, Krishna supplies. So where did it come from? From Krishna. From the same place everybody gets whatever they have. Is, it comes from Krishna. And the devotees are ones who understand that everything comes from Krishna. And Krishna takes care of their needs. Very practical, very practical. Very practical. So I'll end with this. It allows some time for some discussion. In this regard, this verse, Prabhupada told the story. It's a very nice story. Uh, there was a, uh, an acharya who lived in Jagannath Puri who was a scholar in Bhagavad Gita. And a very appropriate name was Arjuna Acharya. That was his name. You know the story? Arjuna Acharya? Arjuna Acharya was writing a commentary on Bhagavad Gita. And when Arjuna Acharya came to this verse, it irritated him. It grated on his sensibilities. Because how could somebody who's constantly devoted to the personality Godhead, whose mind is fixed upon the personality Godhead, expect something from Krishna, like his order supplier. So he, his mind became dis- transcendentally disturbed. So he took his writing instrument and crossed out the line. Vaham yaham. Vaham aham. I personally maintain, preserve what they have and carry what they lack. Vaham yaham. Yoga kshema vaham yaham. Kshema means protection. Yoga kshema vaham yaham. And in that disturbed state of mind, he left the house, his cottage, and went to the ocean to take his midday bath. And shortly after he left, two boys, a little blackish colored boy and a very fair complexion boy came to the door. And they were carrying these amazing fruits and vegetables that the wife of Arjuna Acharya had never seen before. And she said, my, my dear boys, where did you get these vegetables and fruits? I've never seen something of such quality here in Puri. He said, your husband gave them to us and said to bring them to you. So we brought them to you. She said, well, very well. He'll be back shortly from taking his midday bath, why don't you just wait here and he'll be very happy to um, offer you something, some nice reward. And the boy said, oh no, he'll beat us. And she said, my husband's a gentle Brahmin. He'll, he would never beat little boys. And they said, yes, it's true. And they lifted their shirts and showed, see these marks? He beat us, and he beat us, and he beat us. 
We're leaving right now before he gets back. And they left. And the wife of Arjuna Chari was bewildered. My husband beat little boys? He would never do that. Has my husband, husband done that? So her mind was going through those gymnastics. Then Arjuna Charya came back and saw all these fruits and vegetables that such, such quality I've never seen before. Where did you get them? Two young boys came to the door and they, they said that you sent them so we could offer to the deity. And he said, I didn't do that. Can you describe these two boys? Yeah, one looked like this and the other looked like that. And not only that, they lifted up their shirt and showed me marks in their back where you beat them. Did you beat them? And hearing the description of the boys and the whole situation and what had happened before he went to take his midday bath, he understood the whole thing because he's a Brahmin. He's a, an Acharya. Krishna was demonstrating vaham yaham. I personally carry what they lack and preserve what they have. And he fell at the feet of his wife and said, you're so fortunate, you've seen Krishna. I'm not so fortunate. I'm taken a line and scratched out vaham yaham. So for days, Arjuna Chari was walking around Puri just saying over and over again, Vaham yaham, vaham yaham. People thought he had gone mad. Vaham yaham. Because the relationship with Krishna is personal. It's not a, not a bad thing at all. It's a transcendentally wonderful thing that he's very kind and very personal. And it's not like a business deal. You do this, he'll do that. It's just, it's love. Those that don't wish that kind of exchange, he'll not interfere. Those who wish, exactly as the purport is saying, with focused attention, I wish to be in my relationship, in association with Krishna. He reciprocates. And his reciprocation is as said. Whatever it is that one has, he preserves, or he gives, he extends protection. You don't have to ask for it. You can ask for it, that's also nice. But you don't have to ask for it, just like a child doesn't need to ask, uh, mommy, it's getting cold out, can I have a jacket? Mommy's got three jackets, which one do you want? <laughs> don't forget to put your shoes on. You know, it, it, mommies do those things out of love. They don't have to be asked. And, you know, I'm hungry, can I have something to eat? You know, which of these six things do you want? When there's love, there's no need for asking, can you give me protection? Although a devotee may say, I'm seeking your protection, because this matter, in that case, is a matter of opening the heart for that which the person who wants to give is giving. So it's, it's a reciprocation of love with gratitude in one's heart for protection. And whatever it is that one requires, you can ask Krishna for what you require or not ask Krishna for what you require and he'll supply it anyway because he knows what you, what you need and he'll take care of it. No harm to ask but no harm to not ask either and simply ask for the opportunity for engaging in service. This is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teaching. Please just give me the opportunity to remain in your service. There's many, many, many Example of this, examples of this in the Bhagavatam where the devotee is being offered by Lord Vishnu or Krishna or Lord Nishringadev for some benediction. Please take whatever you want. Just please keep me always engaged in your service. Please keep me always in the association of your devotees. And please make my heart always favorably disposed, kindly disposed to all living entities, your parts and parcel living entities. That's the status of pure devotion. And one who regards Krishna that way, he gives them everything that they require and gives them all protection. 
Okay, so there's our Bhagavad Gita verse for this evening and some words about Bhakti Minot Thakur, who were, for those of you who came late, were honoring his appearance day. There's his nice picture. He observed, the picture shows the, the Chatur Masya Vrata. Normally he kept a very cleanly shaven face, except during Chatur Masya he would observe austerities, as did his son, Bhakti Siddhanta. And uh, you see his big neck beads. It was it's described in his biography. He had four sets, different sets of neck beads, and when he was sitting on the high court judge, broad tilak, and four sets of neck beads, like Vaishnava. <laughs> he didn't hide it. He was very clear to everybody who he was. In a situation where, during the British rule, that wasn't wasn't cool. It was something that you would hide. And he didn't hide. He was bold and declaring the supremacy of Lord Vishnu. I am, I am his devotee. So sometimes Prabhupada would say the Krishna consciousness movement will be successful when that day comes when on the high court bench is a judge wearing tilak and neck beats. In other words, referring to as Bhakti Vinod Thakur did, then we'll be really successful. I'll share one other little thing before questions. Yesterday was the 13th. Today's the 14th of September. And in Washington, D.C., they had a big bash, a big function, um, where heads of state and heads of religious organizations. The, the, the venue was three blocks from the White House. They paid a couple of dollars for the venue. And um, a special event where it, it was catering by some, some group of people, but it was all offered for Shadam. We heard a little bit of a report of this today. And um, you know, the head of the Diocese of Washington, D.C., and Senator this one, and, uh, you know, different, the whole long list of people. I can't remember them all. Government people, religious people, and, and others, VIPs. And uh, the, 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 what brought the house down was uh, Tulsi Gabbard. Apparently she was the last speaker, and... As she makes her public speeches, she began this one the same way, you know, with her hands folded. You've seen her videos of her doing her thing. Namaste, Hare Krishna. And the audience was silent. And she went, you know, something like, what's wrong with you people? Come on, let's get into it. Namaste, Hare Krishna. And, you know, spoke very, very nicely about Lord Chaitanya and about Iskan and about Prabhupada. And then she, the, you know, the fi grand finale was she pulled out a ukulele because she's from Hawaii. But then some other name, it's, it's a cross between a guitar and a ukulele, so it's got some other name, a third name. She pulled it out and started playing and started singing and wanted them to sing responsively. And then she said, come on, stand up. So the whole audience, all you know, 500 people or whatever it was, stood up and for 15 minutes she's had a kirtan getting, you know, this assembly of VIPs dancing and chanting the Maha Mantra, Senator Gabbard. You know, she's not a closet person either. You know, the, the high court judge with the tea lock and neck beads, she's a senator with the, her tea lock and neck beads and chanting Hare Krishna in, in, in a, in, I, I don't know if it was nationally televised, there were lots of media people there for the event. So it'll, I'm sure it's gonna be posted on YouTube, probably the whole thing, but for sure, you know, Tulsi's Kirtan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so any um, comments or discussion, questions, anything? Yes? Hare Krishna. Are ghosts real? Are ghosts real, yes. Have you seen one? No? 
That's because they don't have a gross body. Are electrons real? Have you seen one? No. So you don't have to see something to know whether it's real or not. You know about electrons, or we know about things we do not see because of the effect they have. So ghosts have effect on life for these people, specifically persons in the mode of ignorance. They're, they cannot affect people in the quality of goodness, but they can affect people in the quality of ignorance. Anyway, they're real. There's a, there's a place, Bhuta, Bhuta Loka. Yes? Lord Krishna says what? Yeah. How should we understand a devotee who loses things, like material things or maybe it depends. It depends. Depends. It could be karma, it could be Krishna's kindness. In the, in Prabhupada's case it was Krishna's kindness. But somebody else's case it may be their karma. This, you know, the, the past coming to bear in the present. Misdeeds bearing their fruit. So this should be understood that whatever we gain or lose, it's only for our benefit of Not only that, you know, th those things that we need, Krishna will preserve. Things that we think that we need or things that we're attached to, they may not be preserved. But what we need, it's preserved. Yeah, yeah. That's, you know, hearing your question, thinking of one of Lord Chaitanya's most dear and intimate associates was Kolavichar Shridhar. So poor, great devotee, so poor. His clothes had more holes than clothes. And the roof over his thatched hut had more holes than straw because he was so poor. But he was, he was rich. Lord Chaitanya said, I know, you're a miser. You have all your treasure hidden. It's treasures is devotion. And I'm going to expose you one day, but not right now. Right now I want to bargain with you over the price of your banana leaves. <laughs> anyway. So having not having isn't a standard of spiritual well-being. Someone can have lots and have spiritual well-being. Someone can have lots and not have spiritual well-being. And same with... So. What we, the, the, the sense of being protected by Krishna is not on the material side. What we need materially that we, Krishna will see that we have. And if we're too much attached to something material, Krishna may take it away. Girls, sit still. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. Why do they lie? Because he had taken Krishna's words and scratched them out. So the words of Krishna are Krishna. That's what he understood. You scratched out Vahamyaham, you've just put marks on my back. You beat me. Don't do that. Hmm? Anything else? Yeah. Um, as it relates to uh, protecting. Protecting. Yeah. So, at what point we are being pulled by our false ego saying, oh, I'm here to protect you as Krishna put me in this situation to protect. 
Well, the standard is the standard of service. We can do all kinds of things, as Arjuna was asked to do, in service. And the, the, the line, which is, I think, what the question you're asking, is when we're acting through false ego, we're thinking we're doing instead of the instrument of Krishna. Give a real practical example, and then we'll end so we can get ready for RT. Book distribution. You want a question? Let me, let me finish answering this. Book distribution. So we go out the door and we want to distribute books. So we can do through false ego. And that's one kind of endeavor. And then there's, I'm just the instrument of Krishna kind of endeavor. And the experience is different. And the reciprocation from Krishna is different. Now, it's nice when books go out. But it's nice to do that a activity without false ego. It's more appealing to Krishna when we act without false ego. It doesn't mean you'll have a weaker result at the end of the day. You'll have more Krishna consciousness at the end of the day. And Krishna will empower that at the end of the day, at the end of our life. Your question, last question. If we do what? Radharani is going to be get you there quicker? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't forget Krishna, though. If you're going to ask Radharani, don't forget Krishna. Yeah. So therefore, we have a maha mantra. We don't just say Krishna, 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 Krishna. We say, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And my answer is, don't forget Krishna. Oh, you can fast till night. She wants to know why on Krishna's appearance day we fast till midnight and Radharani's appearance day we fast till noon. <laughs> if Radharani's going to get you back to Krishna Loka quicker than Krishna. <laughs> well, Krishna appeared at midnight. That's why we fast till midnight. And Radharani, of course, there's different pastimes of Radharani's appearance, but she appeared early in the morning before the sun came up. So we fast till noon instead of before the sun comes up. In honor of Radharani. Okay. Shri Prabhupada ki, Shri Radha Gopi Balava ki.